So after a long 12-hour workday, I'm back to talk about match week 11 of the English Premier League. And when I say workday, I don't mean I was up all day working on videos. Guys, I have a real job and oh, it took a lot out of me today. So I had to take a nap and then muster up whatever energy I could to come and do this because we had an epic weekend of football and no way I was going to go without talking about all 10 matches but I have to do it fast because guys the Champions League are coming up again and by the time you know it everybody forgot about what happened over the weekend so we we have to discuss these matters so grab a glass of your favorite beverage Make yourself some popcorn or something, grab some chips, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you're interested in getting one of these cards, visit cardsplug.com slash DominicRichFC. Use the coupon code DominicRichFC to get yourself 15% off. All the links would be in the description box down below. Guys, I'm telling you, this is a quality, quality card. If you don't want to get one for yourself, you can get it as a gift for your loved ones. Trust me, they love it. Bournemouth won Man United nil. Yes, you heard it right. Man United lost to Bournemouth. But this was a well-deserved victory for Eddie Howe and his boys because they have been, you know, on somewhat of a very, very unproductive run going five games without a single win in all competitions. Man United, who hasn't been so bad over their last several games, continue their mixed bag form. Let's just call it a mixed bag of form because they win some, they lose some, they pick up jaws, but overall they haven't been so bad. They haven't been as bad as people make it out to be. But it's Man United. They should be up there among the Cities, the Liverpools, the Leicesters, and the Chelsea. But currently, the numbers are very, very subpar. But when you look at this Man United lineup, guys, I'm still not convinced. Daniel James, Pereira, Marcus Rashford, Anthony Martial. That front four does not strike fear in defenders' hearts. I'm afraid to say that. It doesn't. And with guys like Scott McTominay, Fred Lindelof, Harry Maguire, Ashley Young, and Juan Bissaka, man, attackers are running through their midfield like they're not even there. Poor David De Gea in goal hardly has protection sometimes. And I know De Gea hasn't looked good in goal as of late, but guys, you need a very solid defense in front of you if you are to look good as a goalkeeper. Look at Jan Oblak over there at Atletico Madrid. His defense is really, really good. Hence the reason why he gets so many clean sheets. But Man United, Ah, they still have a lot of work to do. It was a very, very scrappy first half. Not a lot of chances created by both teams. Jefferson Lerma and Anthony Martial got into a little melee where the Colombian picked up a fifth yellow of the season and he will miss Bournemouth's next game. The game's only goal was scored in the 46th minute by the former Man United player, Joshua King. It was a nice ball crossed in by Adam Smith. King brought it down nicely with his chest and with his back turned to goal, he flicked it over his shoulder and lashed it past David De Gea. Juan Bissaka was the man challenging King for that ball and it's fair to say that he was outfoxed by the Norwegian. And that must have definitely brought a wry smile out of Man United's Norwegian manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. That goal also ended Bournemouth's longest goal drought for seven years. And this only came about after they had played themselves back into the game. Harry Wilson had a brilliant chance saved by David De Gea in the 75th minute. Mason Greenwood came off the bench and almost scored. And even though Man United had a very good period of sustained pressure, Bournemouth's defense stood firm and held on for the 1-0 win. In this game, Bournemouth had 13 shots at goal with six on target. Man United, 15 shots at goal with four on target. And I must mention that Bournemouth's goalkeeper, Aaron Ramsdale, was spectacular on the day. Man United will probably try to sign him if David De Gea leaves, but I don't think David De Gea is going to leave, but we all know Man United like to link to every single new talent, especially if you're English. Bournemouth had 42% of the possession while Man United had 58%. I think Bournemouth had way too much of the ball here. Like, come on, Man United, you, you could do better than that. As for some insights, Man United have won 13 points 
from their 11 Premier League games this season. Their lowest tally at this stage of the league campaign since the 1986 87 season where they picked up 11 points so this just shows you the state of man united football right now for another insight man united have lost all six of their premier league away games in which they have fallen behind on the ole gunner soul score so they basically have no bounce back ability on the road another insight on man united like where the insights on bournemouth here Man United have failed to keep a clean sheet in any of their last 11 Premier League away games, their joint longest run without one on the road in the competition, also 11 between August of 2002 and January 2003. So they're breaking all sorts of records here, and they're not good records. They're negative records. So will Man United get a turnaround this season? Will they get top four? Will they even get top six? Guys, to be honest, I don't know. But I shouldn't say I don't know. I should actually give you guys an answer. Ah, uh, will they get top six? Guys, I don't think so. For Bournemouth, with this win, they go up to seventh on 16 points and they will play Newcastle on the road in their next fixture. For Man United, they're currently 10th in the league on 13 points. Yes, you heard it right there, 10th. Do you guys believe it? Do you believe it? 10th. Like, you gotta be kidding me. They will host Partizan in the Europa League and then they will play host to Brighton next weekend. Oh. And the way Brighton has been playing, it's going to be a tough game. Sheffield United 3, Burnley 0. Like, you got to be kidding me. Sheffield United are simply on fire this season. Newly promoted team, and they're playing like they have been in the Premier League for the last three to four seasons. They scored all their goals in the first half courtesy of a brace by Lundstrom and a 44th minute goal by Fleck. The names are cool too. Like, what the Fleck are you doing? Like, did you go and get the Lundstrom for me, please? <laughs> as for Sean Dyche and Burnley, their bad run of form continues as they have lost their last three fixtures. But Burnley has themselves to blame because they did not defend very, very well. Also, we have to give Chris Wilder and the Blades a lot of credit for just playing very, very good football and keeping the intensity levels up. The team has simply been amazing and I don't think they're going to get relegated. I think Sheffield will be in the Premier League next season. Mark my word. As for some insights, by scoring three goals all in the first half, Sheffield United equaled their total haul from their previous five home Premier League games. Three in five home matches so previously they had only scored three goals at home and they did it in one game so it was a brilliant performance it was definitely a brilliant performance and guys if i'm not reading this properly the words are very small i think i need eyeglasses <laughs> For another insight, Burnley are winless in their last eight away Premier League games. Like, wow. Their longest such run since their first 17 in the 2016-17 season. So it seems like Burnley are still struggling after their Europa League qualifying matches last season. They haven't been good since. Sheffield United are the 54th different side Burnley manager Sean Dyche has faced in his English League career, but just the fourth he hasn't beaten. Also, failing against Arsenal in nine games, Man United eight games, and Coventry two games. So, Sean Dyche is yet to defeat Sheffield United. So, he will be definitely looking forward to round two later on in the season. So, after that win, Sheffield are currently sixth in the Premier League table. Yes, you heard it right. They're currently top six, 16 points. They will play with the Tottenham in their next Premier League fixture. And Tottenham hasn't really been playing well, so they should fancy themselves to pick up at least one point. Because they're currently ahead of Tottenham too, so when I say fancy themselves, Sheffield the favourites to actually win that game. And no disrespect to Tottenham at all. As for Burnley, who are currently 14th on 12 points, they will host West Ham United in their next Premier League fixture. Brighton 2, 
Norwich City nil. Well, after all the chances that they got, Brighton did deserve to win this game, but they need to be a bit more clinical going forward. But Brighton has been doing a decent job so far this season, defeating Tottenham, defeating Everton, and now defeating Norwich. Like, they're picking up wins. And if you get these wins right now, things would be a lot easier at the back end of the season, where teams are scrapping it out to stay up. As for Norwich City, ever since they famously defeated my team Manchester City, they have not won a single game. Timo Puki has not scored a single goal since then. So, oh man, just bad omen. I just think it's bad omen for Daniel Farke and his boys. And I feel really I feel bad for them because they started out the season quite well and it has just nosedive. And it seems like they're going to just stay there because things just haven't gone their way. Norwich just has the look of a team that are destined to go down. Brighton's goals were scored in the 68 minute courtesy of substitute Leandro Chosard coming off the bench to great effect once again. So you got to give Graham Potter some credit there or maybe not. Maybe Leandro Chosard should be starting for Brighton. He has the look of that type of player that will fit in well at Leicester City. Guys, let me know what you think. But this guy is a very, very good prospect. So don't forget that name, Leandro Trossard. The second goal came in the 84th minute courtesy of their big Irish goal scoring defender, Shane Duffy. And he was also a substitute. So I do think Graham Potter deserves a lot of credit here because Neil Mopai and Aaron Connolly were missing them for fun on the day. But it was definitely Brighton's game to win. 21 shots off at goal, 5 on target, not bad at all. Compared to Norwich's 7 shots at goal, none on target. Norwich needs to turn their fortunes around like right now or Daniel Farke could face the sack. I have to give big shout outs to Tim Krul. He has been amazing in goal, but the goalkeeper alone cannot save you. You need to score goals. Tim Krul is doing what he needs to do, but the forwards are simply not producing. As for some insights, Brighton have won three consecutive home games for only the second time in the Premier League, also in March 2018 under their former boss, Chris Hewton. I wonder what Chris Hewton is up to these days. I gotta check it out. Guys, if you know, let me know in the comment section down below. Norwich's seven points from 11 games this season is their joint lowest points tally at this stage of a top flight season, also seven after 11 in 2004 or five, considering three points for a win. With that win, Brighton are currently eighth in the league on 15 points and they will play away to Man United in their next fixture. As for Norwich, who are currently 19th in the league on seven points, they will play host to Watford in their next Premier League fixture. And the fact that Watford are currently misfiring and they are the only team behind Norwich, Norwich could actually fancy themselves picking up a win. Watford may also fancy themselves picking up their first win of the season as well. So it's going to be a mouth-watering fixture. Let's just say that. Arsenal won, Wolverhampton Wanderers won. Another game in which Arsenal give up the lead from a winning position. And they didn't lose this time. They dropped points once again, just like they did last week against Crystal Palace. And their midweek fixture in the League Cup against Liverpool... They lost. They lost. The game ended in a draw again. They give it up from a winning position. Got knocked out in a penalty shootout. What's going on at Arsenal? They're calling for Una Emery to get sacked. Arsenal fans don't really know what they want. Like, I think anyone who gets the job and doesn't do well, they're going to call for them to get sacked. In match week 10, I chose not to really talk too much about Arsenal. And I missed a big, 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 big story where Granite Xhaka, after getting subbed off, was booed by the crowd. And he mumbled expletives under his breath. Well, we could we could all read lips. We, we could read lips. Those things are easy to read. I'm not a lip reader, but, you know, when you say... We, could, we know what you're saying. And for a captain, I don't think he is setting the right example. If the crowd is booing you, I think you got to deal with it a little bit better. Even though you're human and you have emotions and you may react the wrong way, you still got to keep things professional. You could have just 
walk off the field. Simple. You didn't have to take off the shirt and, you know, curse and storm down in the dressing room and all that. You're, you're the captain, bro. You're the captain. But you also have to blame Unai Emery for, you know, allowing the team to choose Granite Xhaka as a captain. Because seemingly, he is a weak captain. You know what I'm saying? He is not a good representative for the team. It's just that simple. But anyways, Granite Xhaka did not feature in this game. Neither did he feature in the midweek EFL Cup match. Ozil got another rare start after he played the EFL Cup match against Liverpool. And Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang started as their captain. And he is definitely a good candidate to be Arsenal's captain. You know what I'm saying? He's prolific up top. He, you know, has the experience. And he just looks like the kind of person that everyone could look up to. So maybe they should give Aubameyang the captain. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section down below. Arsenal scored first in the 21st minute to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang after he was brilliantly set up by Alexandre Lacazette. We also have to give David Luiz a lot of credit for crossing that ball in as well. That goal also brought up Aubameyang's 50th goal for Arsenal and he is 6th in terms of the number of games he took to get there. Why is that important? He got to that number before Thierry Henry and in terms of who is ahead of him, Ian Wright got to 50 goals after 68 matches. I just like to throw these things in there for you, you know. I know a lot of you guys don't know all the stats, so I like to give you value. Let's just say that. Wolves was a little scrappy early on in the game, but they did grow into the match. They scored their equalizer in the 76th minute from a throw-in after Arsenal defense seemingly fell asleep. It was João Moutinho crossing the ball over to the Mexican Raul Jimenez and he did the rest. We all know how deadly he is in front of goal and you definitely have to blame the Arsenal defenders for this. Like, come on, from a throw-in, you gotta stay a bit more switched on than that. Players fell asleep, literally. But you have to give credit to Nuno Espirito Santo and his boys for fighting their way back and picking up a point from a losing position. This has been the story of their lives this season, and I think it's because of their participation in the Europa League. Arsenal are also in the Europa League, but Wolves isn't a regular in European football. So I think they're finding it a little hard to juggle the Europa League and the Premier League. And judging from the way they played last season, this has definitely been a slow start for Wolves. But you must commend them for getting 25 shots off at Arsenal in this game. Like... 25 comparing to Arsenal's 10. Wolves had eight shots at goal, Arsenal had four. Both goalkeepers pulled off some magnificent saves on the day, so I have to give them credit for that. A lot of people tend to forget what the goalkeepers are doing there, but I like to give everybody credit and give credit when credit is due. But in the end, I have to say this was another game that Arsenal should have won. They should have managed the game a lot better. You have the lead, close up shop, walk away with the three points, even if it's ugly. As for some insights, Arsenal have dropped points having scored the first goal in consecutive home league games for the first time since November of 2004 when they did so against Southampton and West Bromwich Albion. So, new, new, new lows. New lows for Arsenal, man. New lows. Wolves have gone unbeaten in three league games against Arsenal for the first time since a run of three wins between October of 1978 and September of 1979. So when I tell you new lows, I mean new lows. And finally, Wolves have scored in 10 consecutive Premier League games for the very first time. So let's give them a round of applause for this achievement, man. For a newly promoted team last season, they have been brilliant. As for Arsenal, what's next for them? Will they continue to capitulate from winning positions? I think so. I think Arsenal at the end of the season, sixth the highest, no higher than sixth. As for Wolves, I think they may come in around eighth to tenth. And that's if they get knocked out of the Europa League early. 
and it seems like they might go on a deep run. As for Arsenal, with that point, they're currently fifth in the Premier League table on 17 points. And after their Europa League fixture on Thursday, they face Leicester City on the road. And Arsenal, you're going to be in for something because Leicester City are currently on fire. As for Wolves, who are currently 12th on 13 points, after their Europa League fixture, they will play host to Aston Villa. West Ham United 2 Newcastle United 3. Big, big win for Newcastle after a mixed bag of results so far this season. But after all, they're under a new coach in Steve Bruce and they had some turmoil at the beginning of the season. So I think they're still trying to find their feet. But with results like this, they're on the right path to doing so. Newcastle's first two goals were scored by two defenders from two set plays two headers so that just tells you that West Ham are simply crap in defending set piece situations Newcastle's third goal was scored by John Joe Shelby from a direct free kick another set piece so they just had a horrible game they did start a late fight back when Balbuena scored from a set piece in the 72nd minute and Robert Snodgrass scored a one just volley in the 90th minute to make sure the game had a tense finish but overall it was another poor performance from West Ham United and they're currently six games without a win in all competitions so it's not good, not good at all. Since their 2-0 win at home against Manchester United, they have lost to Oxford United in the League Cup, drew against Bournemouth, lost against Crystal Palace, lost to Everton, drew with Sheffield, and now this big loss against Newcastle United. And despite the scoreline being 3-2, Guys, Newcastle dominated that game. Let's just say they managed the game better. Maybe they did not dominate possession, but they managed the game well. They scored three early goals and they just kept what they had. West Ham sparked a late fight back where they had a lot of the possession and all that, but we all know that possession don't really mean much nowadays or has it ever meant anything West Ham had 16 shots at goal with 6 on target Newcastle 12 shots at goal 9 on target and now that I'm talking about the shots on target I must mention that West Ham are definitely missing Lucas Fabianski this new Roberto guy in goal is not good no clean sheet since he filled in for Fabianski. So they need a Polish goalkeeper to be fit and ready like yesterday. West Ham had 70% of the possession compared to Newcastle's 30. Like when I saw that stat, I'm like, what? 30%? Like, how did you win that game? 3-2. Like for most of the game, they were 3-0 up. So... It just highlights how bad West Ham has been playing. And another thing, another thing, another thing. Newcastle scored three goals and Joel Linton wasn't even able to get on the score sheet. He did set up one of the goals, but you were bought to score goals, not set him up. You want to set him up too, but you're here to score goals. One goal, I think, in 11 games. Not good. As for some insight, West Ham are now without a win in five Premier League games, two draws, three losses. The longest winless streak in the competition since a run of eight ending in December of 2017. So, not good. Pellegrini, you could do better than that, bro. All right, guys, listen to this insight very closely. Newcastle have scored more than once in a Premier League game for the first time this season, becoming the last side in the top flight to hit two plus goals in a match in the competition this season. Again, not good, but they're getting better. West Ham boss Manuel Pellegrini suffered his first defeat in his ninth Premier League meeting with Newcastle, previously winning seven and picking up one draw. Again, guys, new lows with this loss west ham united are currently 13th in the league on 13 points and they will play away to burnley in their next premier league fixture as for newcastle this win definitely give them a big boost in the point standing they're currently 15th in the league on 12 points and they will play host to bournemouth in their next premier league fixture crystal palace nil leicester city two well the foxes just continue winning and winning and winning and winning the games that they're supposed to win 
and that's a hallmark of a very 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 good team. Leicester City are currently in a better position than they were when they won the title in the 2015-16 season. So is that an indication that they are going to win the title this season? Maybe, maybe not, but they have just been amazing. I saw this game today and they were amazing. They managed the game very, very well. They kept Crystal Palace very, very quiet. Whenever Crystal Palace had a chance, they, you know, stifled them, threw them off their game. And Leicester, whenever they had their chance, they punished them. And to further highlight how good Leicester City has been under Brendan Rodgers, Crystal Palace has been dominating this fixture for a very, very long time. Like, it was a weird stat that Crystal Palace has just been beating Leicester every time they meet him. But they lost the game today. With the game still level at halftime, Leicester's first goal came in the 57th minute, courtesy of their big Turkish defender, Chagla Soyanchu. It was a brilliant corner taken by Madison, flicked on at the near post by an opposition player, and pounced on by Soyanchu to beat Guaita in goal. And I want to talk a little bit about Soyanchu. After Harry Maguire was sold, a lot of people were wondering why Leicester didn't buy another center half. But guys, they do have center halves. They have a guy by the name of Filip Benkovic, a Croatian. He was on loan at Celtic. He is decent. And they had Soyanchu, who was waiting in the wings. And you got to give him credit because I always used to see him on the bench. And I'm like, why are they not playing him? But um, they have cover. They even have Wes Morgan who was part of the winning team back in 2015-16. And he is just collecting his paycheck and coming on for a few minutes here and there. You know, so Leicester is in a good situation right now. <laughs> Definitely in a good situation. The second goal was scored by Jamie Vardy in the 88th minute and it was brilliantly set up by Demari Gray, who came off the bench to great effect. That was a very, very good team goal. The way they moved the ball and, you know, Demari Gray's run and cutting back for Vardy, who hit it first time and all, it, it was just simply sublime. And with that goal, Jamie Vardy became the first player this season to hit double figures. Goal number 10. Guys, do you think he is capable of picking up the golden boot this season? I think he's capable, especially with the service he's getting from the very hard-working Yuri Telemans. Dennis Pratt and Didi and company in the middle there. Man, I think Leicester are going to do big, big, big things this season. And oh, I actually forgot to mention Madison in the middle as well. So these guys, these guys, these guys are looking good. But with that said, guys, I have a big question for you. Which Leicester team looks better? The 2015-16 unit or the current team under Brendan Rodgers? If I'm going to answer that question, I would say... This team looks a lot better, but the 2015-16 team, maybe they were better. They were a, a more grittier team with like Fuchs and guys like Kante in the middle, Riyad Mahrez, and the, the list goes on. Okazaki, you know, um, who else was there? Um, Ojoa. It, it, it was... It, that was a remarkable team. You gotta put respect on that team. But this one has a bit more sheen to it. With the likes of Chilwell, Ricardo, Soyanchu, Johnny Evans, Michael still there, Madison added, and Didi added, Dennis Pratt added, Ayosi Perez is there. This this team, this team, you know, Yuri Telemans, this team looks good. Brendan Rodgers, I think you have something great here and you should do whatever you can to preserve it and, you know, just use the team to the best of your ability and I, I think you guys might just get top four. Seriously. Leicester are serious top four contenders this season. They're looking freaking good. As for some insights, guys, this was Leicester's 12th Premier League win under Brendan Rodgers. Since his first game in charge, only Liverpool on the club has 19 wins and Man City on the Pep Guardiola with 17 have won more than the Foxes, man. Big, big, big achievement. That's how good Leicester City has been this season and last when Rodgers took over. Crystal Palace have lost back-to-back -back home Premier League games for the first time since March 
when they lost to Brighton and Man United. So Roy Hodgson has been doing a very good job with this team. And I heard that he's in talks of extending his contract going into his 74th year. This is, this is r ridiculous. I wish him all the best and I wish him a long career. Leicester's Jamie Vardy is the first player to score 10 Premier League goals this season. The last time he was the first player to reach 10 in a season was the 2015-16 season when they went on to win the title. Signs, guys. Signs. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they are not signs. Maybe they are signs that Leicester are going to get top four. But right now, guys, it's looking good. The title race is shaping up very, very well. Liverpool, Man City, Leicester, Chelsea. It's looking good. These guys are pulling away. They're pulling away from the rest. The, the, the stragglers, Arsenal and Tottenham and the Sheffield Uniteds and the Wolves and the Man Uniteds and the whoever else falls into that bracket. They're pulling away. With that loss, Crystal Palace are currently 9th on 15 points and their next Premier League game will be on the road against Chelsea. As for Leicester City, who are currently 3rd in the league on 23 points, they will play host to Arsenal next weekend. That's one of the games that I don't want to miss. I hope it's not clashing with the Liverpool Man City fixture. I hope they didn't schedule it like that because I'll be pissed. I want to watch this game and I want to talk about this game as well. I'm going to put my money on Leicester right now. I would not put money on Arsenal. So good luck to the Foxes. Them Foxes looking good this season. Watford 1, Chelsea 2. And yes, guys, Watford are still winless this season after 11 games pinned at the bottom of the league table. Oh, guys. It's Watford going down this season. Are they going down? That's a big question. Are they going to go down? Seems like they are. Guys, do you think Chelsea are potential dark horses to win the title? They're looking good. They're looking good. After a, a choppy start, they have, you know, they have been good. Let's just say that. Chelsea's first goal was scored by Tammy Abraham in the fifth minute. And God damn. What a pass. What a pass by Jorginho, man. That pass was just simply exquisite. And they're saying that this is the best pass of the entire season. Like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the games that's not even played yet. This pass is the best all season. Like, nothing that's forthcoming can beat that pass because it was just that good. And the finish from Tammy Abraham was sublime as well. Brought up his ninth Premier League goal this season. Abraham, man, you have been really, really good. You have been keeping Bashuai out of the team. You have been keeping Olivier Giroud out of the team. And for a youngster who are, who are coming up from the championship, well, you were on loan in the championship. You're doing very well, and I'm happy for you. Seriously. Abraham had a shot save. Pulisic had a header save by Ben Foster, who was pretty pretty good on the day let's just say that he, he was good he pulled off some big saves and what i mean he pulled off some big saves he did remember that bullet shot by mason mount that he tipped onto the crossbar that was definitely going in but guys this guy mount is a very very bright prospect for the future england's future is looking very 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 good the guys like Mount and Abraham and James and Hudson Odoi and, you know, Lobster's Cheek. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on, you know? These guys, these young, these, these this current batch of youngsters are very, very good. After going down early in the match, Watford did play themselves in the game a little, but then they conceded again. And the second goal came courtesy of the American Christian Pulisic, who was scoring his fourth goal in two matches. He was brilliantly set up by Tammy Abraham as well. So Abraham with the assist, Abraham with the goal. He's having a great season. And if Pulisic continue to put them in the back of the net like this, I think he is, you know what I mean, he's going to score 15 and pick up about 10 assists, like I, I, I mentioned before. I want him to do very, very well because people are underestimating this player. If you watch him play for the U.S. men's national team, he, he, he is a, he's too good for that team. Seriously. I think 
when you think about it, I know I'm American and all, but when you think about it, Pulisic, maybe you should have played for Croatia. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Seriously, the man is very patriotic and all, and he wants to play for America. So I think he made the right choice. Maybe. Watford was awarded a dodgy penalty that Gerard De La Feo stepped up to score. And when I say dodgy, I mean, you know, VAR was involved. And guys, at this point, I don't know, man. Seriously, I don't know what's a penalty from what's not a penalty. Because sometimes you see some very soft, simulated ones given. And sometimes the legit ones are not even given. So... I don't know. I, I don't want to elaborate on it. If you want to elaborate on it, please do so in the comment section down below because I'm not going to elaborate on it. Gerard De La Feo stepped up to score his first Premier League goal this season. The game ended two goals to one. But wait, wait, wait. It almost ended in a draw. The final kick of the ball where Watford had a free kick. Ben Foster, their goalkeeper, came up, their veteran goalkeeper. He came up and he almost headed in. And it took a brilliant save from Kepa Aritzabalaga to snatch the full three points for Chelsea. I wanted to see Ben Foster score that goal. It would have made for a great, great review. The review is still great, but still, still, still. That would have been a nice headline, though. Ben Foster's header seals point for struggling Watford. Ben Foster's header ultimately proves to be the difference between Watford surviving and going down. But let me stop dreaming. But that was a very, very good win for Chelsea, though, where they had 16 shots at goal, 10 on target. They had 67% of the possession. They bossed this game. They managed it well. And they picked up a well-deserved three points to go fourth in the Premier League table. As for Watford, their woes continue. They can't seem to get the ball in the back of the net and they can't seem to keep it out either. As for some insights, Chelsea have won seven consecutive games in all competitions. Their joint longest run on the road in the club's history. Also seven between February and April 1989 under Bobby Campbell. So round of applause to Frank Lampard and his boys, man. They're doing big things. They're doing big things. Setting new records and all. Seven consecutive away games. Oh, man. While Tottenham hasn't won an away game since January? Amazing stuff, if you ask me. Another insight. Watford have failed to win any of the opening 11 games to a league season for the very first time in their history. Drawing five, losing six. At least they didn't lose all 11, right? They are the first team to do so in the Premier League since QPR in the 2012-13 season. And I think QPR did get relegated that season, so. Watford, man. Sorry to say. That's it for you in the Premier League. And who knows? You might be the next Sunderland where you go into the championship and then get relegated to League One. So, all the best. All the best. And I think the board deserves it after treating all their managers like doo-doo. The last insight, Chelsea have won consecutive away games against Watford for the very first time in the top flight of English football. Having also won this exact fixture last season, 1-2. So... Good stuff, man. Again, round of applause to Frank Lampard and Chelsea. They are flying. And guys, they're doing all this without the services of N'Golo Kante, who is currently struggling with injury. I guess after seasons of just running and constant running and running and running, Kante has finally broken down. So I wish him a speedy recovery. And I hope to see him back in the blue of Chelsea pretty soon. For Watford, who are still currently winless this season after 11 matches, they are glued to the bottom of the table on 5 points. Their next fixture will be on the road against Norwich City. And I think this is a game they could pick up a win in, but I don't know. Norwich needs the win as well, so 
it just might end up in a draw. As for Chelsea, who are currently fourth in the Premier League table on 23 points, they will play host to Crystal Palace in their next match after they host Ajax in the Champions League. So guys, do you think Chelsea under Frank Lampard and with the youngsters in the team got what it takes to win the Premier League? I'm not going to say top four. They got what it takes to get top four, but could they win? Could they overtake City, Leicester, Liverpool? Let me know the answer down below. We have three matches left, and you know what they say? Save the best for last. Man City, two. Southampton, one. Aston Villa, one. Liverpool, two. And we had Everton, one. Tottenham Hotspur, one. Let me talk briefly about the Man City-Southampton game. I made a whole video about that, so I don't really need to go in depth today. Because, guys... It takes a long time to talk about all 10 games. And I'm only one man. So I have to, you know, shoot the vid, edit the vid, you know, make a thumbnail, a whole production behind this video. So I'm not going to stay too long talking about the games I already spoke about. So I'm going to put links in the description box down below to the Man City game and to the Liverpool match. There's 40 something minutes of, you know, me talking about those. So I won't stay too long right now. But Man City 2, Southampton 1. And that was one of the greatest comebacks I've seen in a very, very long time. We needed that win. We needed that win. We cannot afford to drop any more points this season. Especially with Liverpool winning their games. Like we can't. They were also involved in a very remarkable comeback as well. But I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll get there. James Ward-Prowse opened the score for Southampton in the 13th minute after he pounced on an Edison mistake. The ball was blasted in by Armstrong. Edison spilled it. Ward-Prowse was first to it and put it in. Kyle Walker, I gotta blame you for that. You were kind of flat-footed there. When you watch the replay, you could see him... Watching the whole thing happen, he should have done something. But you have to give Ward Prowse the credit for, you know what I'm saying, for being hungry and, you know, pouncing on that loose ball. 1-0 up. And it was tense. It was tense up until Sergio Aguero scored after Kyle Walker, who made amends for his ball watching mistake earlier. And I'm going to call it a mistake because he should have done better. He crossed in really, really nice. Aguero with the first time finish. Beat the goalkeeper 1-1. We had opportunities to score and we were troubling Southampton for most of the game. But they did well. They did well to put us off our game and they did well to keep us scoreless. But sooner or later, the, the, the levy was going to break. It was going to break. The pressure was too much city have way too much quality for southampton to keep them scoreless for more than 70 minutes after aguero's equalizer carl walker came to the party when he scored in the 86th it was a brilliant crossing by angelino misjudged by mccarthy and carl walker was first to it to slot in to score his first goal of the season and he celebrated like a madman. It was a nice slide across the field. And I was saying, how come they don't like bruise their knees when they slide like that? What if there's like a, you know, like a, a small stone in the grass or something, you know? Like players could get injured celebrating like that. But it was a glorious celebration. I really, really enjoyed it. It meant a lot. And we picked up three points. He gave us th three points there. My man of the match, he was... Simply, simply brilliant. City had 26 shots at goal, 4 on target. So that's very, very poor. I think we should have done a lot better than that. Southampton had 3 shots at goal, 3 on target. Poor. Poor. Accuracy good, but the amount of shots they had, very, very poor. We had 76% of the possession compared to Southampton's 34. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine at work today and I was explaining to him how we break teams down. We keep the ball and we just have him chasing the ball for the entire game. And the more tired you get, the less you concentrate. But with City's high quality players, they could keep their concentration levels up for way longer. And that's exactly how we won the game. They switched off. 
No one was marking Aguero when Kyle Walker made that overlapping run. I explained to him they switched off. He was saying, why are the defenders not on Aguero? They weren't on Aguero because of that Kyle Walker run threw them off. He drew defenders to him, crossed the ball in, Aguero was empty and he slotted in first time. And it's very, very easy to explain. We are just a four more superior team. And this is a team that we had just defeated in the middle of the week in the League Cup. And this is a team coming off of a 9-0 battering to the hands of Leicester City. So Southampton, you have a lot of improvement to do. And guys, I don't know how much longer Ralph Hasenhuto will last as the manager of Southampton because they haven't been good. We're going to see a, a few sackings in the next week or two. Southampton, they sat their manager. Everton's manager, Marco Silva, under a lot of pressure as well. And Daniel Falker under pressure. A few more managers under pressure. So let's see how that one turn out. Uh, a couple of these guys could get Nico Kovac. But Pep Guardiola will definitely be delighted with this performance put out by Manchester City. Because they, they, needed to do, they needed to do this. They needed to do this. We couldn't drop more points. Losing to Norwich. Embarrassing. We can't, we can't, we can't. Nah, nah. Uh-uh. We can't lose to these smaller teams anymore. It ain't gonna happen. It ain't happening no more. Seriously. I'm calling it now. We ain't drop. We ain't dropping no more points against these smaller teams. Liverpool will be the next fixture, guys. Liverpool. So it's a big one. As for some insights, Manchester City have won each of their last six Premier League meetings with Southampton extending their longest ever winning run against the Saints in league competition. Man City had to wait until the 70th minute for their first shot on target in this match, which resulted in Sergio Aguero scoring. It is the longest they've had to wait for their first shot on target in the league since December of 2016 against Leicester City, when their first shot on target came in the 82nd minute. So that was a new low for us. We can't, we can't, we can't repeat it. We can't repeat it. We got to get shots at goal from the first minute. First minute, five minutes, ten minutes. We got to get our shots on goal. Concentration levels weren't as high as I said they were. Southampton are winless in their last 20 away Premier League games against big six teams. Oh, big six teams. Join four, losing 16 since a 2 1 win against Spurs in May of 2016. So that's basically what you get for selling all your best players. You cannot keep selling your best players and not replacing them adequately. Like it ain't gonna work. Southampton wasn't a team spending big money, and now they're spending money and the players are not producing. Like I don't think they're scouting well enough. Seriously. Like, you have to go back to the old way of doing things. Hire who you had there before. Br try try your best to bring them back. Because this is not the Southampton that we know. With this loss, Southampton are currently in the relegation zone on 8 points. They will play Everton on the road in their next fixture. Two struggling teams. I hope one of them picks up a win. Because they both need the win. So... It should be a good game. As for my team, Manchester City, we are currently second in the league on 25 points. We will play the table toppers Liverpool next Sunday in what will be one of the biggest games, if not the biggest game of the season. So, guys, you know your boy will be watching that. I might not even go to work for that game. But let's move on to the next fixture, Aston Villa 1. Liverpool 2. As I said earlier guys, I made a whole video talking about this game in detail so I promise you I won't be long. Aston Villa's first goal was scored by Trezeguet in the 21st minute and when on close review, VAR should have chalked that off for offside. A few minutes later, Firmino equalized but his goal was deemed to be offside and VAR confirmed it when it, maybe it was only his nipple and his armpit that was offside. So, VAR, you need to get things right. And as someone commented and said, VAR is perfect. It's just the people 
behind it don't know what the hell they are doing. So let me know if you guys agree with that statement. Let me know down below. Let me know your thoughts on VAR as well. After numerous chances, Liverpool continue to fight. They never give up. They continue to fight. They continue to wear Aston Villa down. And their goal finally came in the 87th minute when a brilliant left-footed crossing by Sadio Mane was met brilliantly by the head of Andy, 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 Andy Robertson. And he just headed in the back of the goal. 1-1. One, one. And I was like, oh man, these guys never ever give up. They just never ever give up. And I was hoping that they were going to drop points because we had just went ahead. And I was like, we could close this gap to three. But Liverpool, they equalized. And then with, I think it was the final kick of the ball, or the final head of the ball, they scored. Sadio Mane, I, I don't understand how he got that header on target. How it happened, I don't know. But we have to give credit to Trent Alexander-Arnold who is playing his 100th match for Liverpool for that brilliant delivery though. Definitely have to give him credit for that. But Aston Villa, I think it was very poor game management by Dean Smith and his boys. Very, very poor game management. As for Jurgen Klopp and his boys, oh man, that never ever say die attitude is just like, it's, it's something serious, man. It's something serious. They showed it during the week against Arsenal in that 5-5 EFL Cup fixture and they show it again. In the game against United, they, they, they show it and they, they just keep, but they, they have been made to grind out their results. They, they are, they're having to grind out their results. And I'm wondering how much more longer or how, how, much, how much longer could they grind for? Seriously. Because they, they, they must drop a full three points sooner rather than later. And I think that might be coming up next Sunday when they play Manchester City. But credit goes to Jurgen Klopp and his boys. As I said, guys, go check out that video. I spoke about that game for like 22 minutes. As for some insights, Sadio Mane has scored the 35th, 90th minute winning goal by Liverpool in the Premier League. At least 10 more than any other side in the competition's history. Five of those have come since the start of last season more than any other team. So, guys, you know how I feel. You know how I feel. I'm there thinking Liverpool are going to drop points and bam, they win the game. You know what I mean? And it was the same story again the other day. Liverpool are unbeaten in seven Premier League games in which they have conceded the first goal. This is ridiculous. Winning six of those and drawing one, the game against Man United. They have won more points from losing positions, 10, than any other side in top flight this season ah they go down they know how to come back they are ahead they know how to keep it simply hallmark of a very very good team guys is this the year where liverpool finally win their first ever title in the premier league era dethroning my team manchester city let me know your answer in the comment section down below i don't think so but guys it's not what i think it, you know it could happen it could happen. They, they, they're showing signs of making it happen. Liverpool have earned 31 points from their 11 Premier League games this season. In English top flight history, only Tottenham in 1960-61 with 33, adjusting to 3 points per win, have had more at this stage of a campaign. So, no team has done better. No team has done better in the Premier League, basically. This is the best Premier League start ever, according to this stat. So, should I say congrats to Liverpool for winning the Premier League title already? Should I, should I give it to them already? I think not. And for the final game, guys, Everton won, Tottenham Hotspur won. It was pretty boring game at first, in the first half. Let's just say that, very, very boring first half, nil-nil. 
And I'm like, oh man, guys, this is a snooze fest. I think I even fell asleep for five to 10 minutes while watching that game. There was no Harry Kane in this match. He was suffering from a virus. Don't ask me what type of virus, but he was suffering from a virus. He didn't even travel with the team. There was more VR blunder in this game when Everton should have been awarded a penalty when Delhi Ali handled the ball. And they didn't use all the camera angles available. I, I don't know what to say. If you have all the camera angles available, use all angles possible. They didn't, and when it was deemed not to be a penalty, the commentators were saying, look at that angle. It was definitely a handball, but VAR, man, at its finest, once again this season. The first goal of the game was scored by Tottenham in the 63rd minute when the former Arsenal player, Alexi Wobi, pounced on by Han ming Son, who passed the ball to Deli Ali, who wiggled himself through the Everton defense, got the shot off to beat Pickford in goal. Deli Ali really needed that goal because his form has been very, very terrible as of late. And there were calls for him to, to basically step up. Tottenham needs you right now. You have to step up. They haven't been in good form. They haven't been traveling well. Not winning a single away game in the Premier League since last January. So... <sighs> But what I really want to talk about in this game, guys, is the biggest talking point of this match. The Hun Ming Sun tackle, which resulted in Andre Gomes fracturing his ankle. It was a dislocation and a fracture. Dislocated fracture, something like that. Where his ankle basically went sideways when his foot was like straight. So if you put your foot straight, you cannot bend your ankle that way it could only go like this but Andre Gomez his was like that way horizontal so it, it was like it, it was a scary thing to see and this sparked a big talking point I made a video about this it got over 60,000 views I, I don't know how it did so well I don't know if, if, if it's because I put Han Ming Son's name in the title the Koreans were watching it. I really don't know. But the video did well. It did great. And I appreciate it. I put little to no effort into that video. And it did numbers. While this one might not do so well. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I just want to talk about this thing. And I want to hear your feedback. Guys, what do you think about this whole incident? Is Han Ming Son guilty of some foul play here? Remember, early on in the game, he went down in a box. VR reviewed it. Didn't give a penalty. When you look back at the replay, he was diving. He was diving. Olympic level diving. Like, that was Yerimina tackling there, like the challenge. But Yerimina... I, I guys, I don't even know what to say, but Han Ming Son, he I don't know, man. It was some good acting. Let's just say it was some good acting. He should have picked up a yellow card for that. He didn't. He got away. And him and Andre Gomes was involved in an incident where Gomes was holding up the ball. His elbow hit Son in his face. Like, I don't think Gomez meant to elbow Son in his face. It was just getting, you know, Son off of the ball. Son went down, acting again. Guys, I'm gonna talk it. I'm gonna talk it how it is. I'm gonna say it how it is. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm gonna keep it real. Maybe a lot of people will come on YouTube and not be real here, but I'm gonna keep it a hundred percent. I'm gonna keep it a thousand, man. Seriously. Son simulated again. He stayed down for a while, but he got up. After that. The first opportunity he had to lash out, he lashed out. He never meant for Andre Gomez to break his ankle. That wasn't the intention at all, don't get me wrong. But his intention was to take out Andre Gomez, getting revenge for that earlier elbow in his face. And if you go back and you watch the replay, if you don't agree with me or you agree with me, 
But for those of you guys who don't agree with me, go back and watch the replay. You would see exactly what happened. Angel Gomez started around a halfway mark with the ball and he didn't get too far. So the ball wasn't in a dangerous position. It wasn't in Tottenham's third of the field. Gomez wasn't going to go in on goal to score nothing. It was an unnecessary tackle. It was very, very unnecessary. Son had cover. Aurier was there to cover. And I know a lot of people are saying that it was Aurier's fault and it was the clatter into Aurier that caused the break. No, guys. If you go back and you watch closely, Andre Gomesh, he got past Son. And when Son realized that he was no longer going to win the ball, he lashed out. He took the opportunity. I don't even know if he, his intention was to get the ball in the first place. But go back and you watch. Gomez got past Son. And Son put in the tackle. It wasn't a trip. It wasn't even a trip. At first I thought it was a trip. It happened very, very quickly. And the feed I was watching it on, NBC TV, did not play it over. They did not show us a replay of what happened. And I wonder why they do things like that. Maybe because of the horrendous nature of the injury. I don't know why they do that. But they didn't show us the replay. Son lunged in. It was a very brutal tackle. And to be honest, I don't know if it's the tackle that broke his ankle. I don't know. I don't know. Or if it was the landing. It looked like it was the landing. But the tackle was so bad that, he th that it, it threw him off. It threw him off. He landed really badly on that ankle. Broke it. Clattered into Aurier who was, you know, coming in for the challenge. Aurier had nothing to do with the ankle. Go back, watch the replays. You would see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not just saying this because I have something against Son. I don't have nothing against Son. But guys, if you could remember last season against Bournemouth, when he was challenged, he got up and pushed the Bournemouth player and got a direct red card. So Son has a temper. There's history here. So I'm, people might be, be, be like, oh, Son is such a nice guy. What? This is not talking about the person, Son. I'm not talking about Son as an individual. I'm talking about Son as a footballer here. Something is frustrating him. Maybe it's a situation at Tottenham Hotspur. Frustrating him. At first, he picked up a yellow because the referee didn't know the extent of the injury and he didn't, the, the challenge didn't look so bad. But he probably got word from VAR that, listen, this is way more than a yellow. Sun lunged in and he deserves a straight red. So he'll miss the next three matches, Premier League matches. And this will probably go into review or something because it was a dangerous tackle. That led to a horrific injury. Could be a career-ending injury. Gomez is out for the season, for sure. Maybe next season as well. And this is a player who has just recently came back from injury. And he was looking pretty decent in the game for Everton. But after that whole incident, Son got sent off. Tottenham down to 10 men. They conceded. Marco Silva brought on Dominic Calvert-Lewin and Jeng Tucson. That's two strikers. Richarlison was also on the field. It paid off. It paid off. Big, big goal. It was a nice cross-field diagonal ball. And by Yerimina, he even slipped. Dinia with the delivery and Jeng Tucson with the header. The Turkish Glenn Murray scored his first ever Premier League goal this season. And... It proved to be a master stroke from Marco Silva, who really needed this point. He really, really needed this point for Everton. He is under a lot of pressure. He, he may still get sacked. He may still get kovached. We don't know about We We really don't know. We don't know what would happen. But I think Everton should stick with him, give him another try, and he would deliver the goods. Seriously, he should. So Alex Iwobi must be a relieved man. That his error did not cost his team all three points. They still went on to pick up a point here. But it was one dramatic fixture. It went from boring to dramatic in like a flash. 
Guys, do you think Son deserved the red card? Do you think he did it purposely? Let me know what you think. Just give me your raw thoughts in the comment section down below. Don't hold it back. Don't be afraid of the internet. Let me know your thoughts. With that draw, Everton are currently 17th in the league on 11 points. They will play Southampton on the road in their next fixture. As for Tottenham, who are currently 11th in the league on 13 points, they will play host to the Blades of Sheffield, who are coming to slice and dice Tottenham. You know, Sheffield has been in good form, so it's not going to be an easy game for Tottenham, but they will be at home, so... But, 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 Sheffield has been traveling well. You know, these things are coming. Sheffield has been traveling. But Tottenham, man, their poor form continues, especially their form on the road. So, guys, let me know your thoughts on Tottenham Hotspur. Let me know if you think they will catch themselves and get top four this season. Do you think Marco Silva will get sacked? How high you think Everton will place this season? Do you think they will get relegated? Let me know all your thoughts in the comment section down below. Guys, it's currently very late. Very, very late. It took me a long time to do this recap. I'm currently rethinking this recap because it's taken a lot of time. And with the volume of football that we have these days, oh, you just don't have time to cover things. It's like by the time you blink, there's, there's more things to cover. But I think I'll continue. I think I'll continue. But guys, that's time. That's my recap of match week 11. It was a very, very dramatic week. I really enjoyed it. And match week 12 will be here by the time we blink. So guys, it's your boy Dominic Rich. Thank you very much for getting to the end of this video. If you're new around here, consider hitting the subscribe button. Smash the thumbs up button in the comment section down below. Let me know of any big talking points that I failed to talk about in this video. I'm only human. I can't talk about everything I did my best. Also, don't forget to visit cardsplug.com slash DominicRichFC. Use the coupon code DominicRichFC to get you 15% off. All the links would be in the description box down below. So, from your boy Dominic Rich, until my next video, I'd like to say thanks for watching. Peace out. Rich Squad!